This episode is brought to you by CuriosityStream. Get free access to Nebula, the streaming platform built by all your favorite YouTubers, when you sign up for CuriosityStream at the link below. Imagine for a moment a society in which every human is afforded the basics of life. A reasonable income, a place to live, there's plenty of food and other necessities for everyone. Competition over scarce materials is no longer necessary. This stage of progress is called post-scarcity. If you've ever seen Star Trek, you're already familiar with the concept of a highly advanced post-scarcity society. Jobs are optional and based on personal preference and inclination, yielding many more people working in creative fields and the arts than we see in our modern reality. The Federation doesn't use money, despite the existence of banks and credits, which is a little confusing, but maybe a Trekkie can explain it in the comments. Every once in a while there's a shortage, but as a general rule, there's enough of everything to go around. The actual economic structure of the Federation is unclear. There have been suggestions that it's a form of techno-communist or highly advanced socialist system, but it's never explicitly spelled out. What we do know is that the Star Trek society has found a way to decouple human value from work, and provide all their citizens the necessities of life. This is an advanced form of what's called universal basic income. It's a fascinating idea, and with more and more jobs being performed more quickly and cheaply by machines, it just might become a necessity in the coming decades. In this episode, we're going to look at some examples of UBI trials in the real world and discuss whether universal basic income might be the future. When talking about seemingly crazy economic plans like UBI, a lot of people's first reaction is one of disbelief. Wait, just give everyone money? That's crazy. Or, but humans need to work, what else will we do? These are both very understandable objections at face value. But let's explore a bit further. Why do we think giving people enough money to survive is crazy? If we as a society have the resources to provide a secure financial floor, essentially eliminating poverty and the societal problems that come with it, why wouldn't we do it? I'm sure the knee-jerk response would be, because it's expensive, and that's a fair assessment. But we do a lot of expensive things. Endless wars are expensive, healthcare is expensive, infrastructure is expensive, but we pay for all these things without batting an eye. But we'll get to the cost of UBI later. In response to the claim that humans need to work, that work is supposedly our natural state, sure, meaningful use of our time may be important, but somehow I don't think working on a production line making 30 different kinds of poop emoji pool floats counts as meaningful work. The idea that our natural state is to work for a wage is a perversion of the understanding of existence. Obviously, we're not meant to just sit around and do nothing. But work doesn't just mean standing at a cash register all day. Work, in the fulfilling a human need sense, can be anything from writing music, to rock climbing, to creating art, to raising children, to any number of other things that don't earn you money in our current system. Today, if we see someone who's not employed, whether they're creating beautiful paintings in their mom's basement or performing with their band on a street corner, we consider them lazy and somehow worth less than someone who sells hours of their life for a wage. This is a problem. If we can decouple human value from wage labor, we'll have a much richer understanding of what it means to be human. Is working a meaningless job producing cheap junk really any better than not working? I don't think so. And it's certainly not more worthwhile than pursuing a passion, even if that passion doesn't pay. Some people just want to work a simple job. That's fine. But that needs to be understood as a personal desire, not as a supposedly natural state. Alright, are we all on the same page? Meaningful work is not the same thing as having a day job. Now that we understand why having a traditional job is not critical to human flourishing, it seems a lot more reasonable to want to provide everyone a basic income, right? Then we add in the possibility of massive layoffs caused by increased automation, and a cool idea becomes an imperative. What happens if self-driving trucks eliminate all the trucking jobs? That's 7.5 million people out of work, or roughly 6% of the entire US workforce. And trucking jobs aren't the only ones at risk. Agriculture, fast food, retail, even things like insurance underwriting, they're all ripe for a robot revolution. As alarming as this may seem, we can take a couple of different perspectives on the change. On the one hand, the cynic in me believes that runaway capitalism will encourage automation at the expense of human workers, replacing them with cheap-to-run machines that further enrich the already obscenely wealthy, leaving millions to starve. On the other hand, there is the possibility that a universal basic income could be implemented in tandem with this dramatic shift in the labor landscape, freeing workers from their traditional jobs, allowing robots to do the menial work, and providing a base level of security that would allow humans to pursue their desires, whether that's improving themselves, taking a sabbatical, or learning a craft. So, we can choose to do nothing and end up with a techno-dystopia, or begin to seriously consider seemingly radical ideas like UBI. But how radical is it, really? Believe it or not, the notion of providing a basic standard of living to a population has been around since at least the 16th century. 
Since that time, UBI has earned the support of people from all across the political spectrum, from rabid free market enthusiasts like Milton Friedman, to proto-socialist revolutionaries like Thomas Paine, to Martin Luther King, to, most recently, Democratic presidential hopeful Andrew Yang. It's not often that an idea gets the support of such a philosophically diverse bunch of people. Of course, opponents of UBI also come from across the political landscape. Let's have a look at some of the arguments leveled against universal basic income. First and foremost is the claim that giving people, quote, free money will make them lazy and disincentivize work. This is the same accusation that's used when discussing welfare of any sort. And based on some preliminary data, there seems to be more of a correlation with disincentivization with welfare of the sort we see in America versus less means-tested options like no-strings-attached UBI. Of course, we'll definitely want a larger sample size before we make any huge investments and replace the welfare state with UBI. But there is some evidence to indicate that when a person is guaranteed a certain amount of money without the stipulation of needing to seek work to replace that money, they're actually more likely to find a job. You're probably thinking, wait, that doesn't make any sense. Think about it like this. Many current welfare systems require recipients to actively seek employment, but the money you get from welfare will be reduced or removed entirely when you find a job. And in many cases, you'll be worse off than you were before you found that job. This makes it far less appealing to look for work. If, on the other hand, you're guaranteed the money regardless of what job you get, you'd be much more likely to look for work because you'd be making money from that job, plus the UBI payments. Even a part-time job would be an option, since, as opposed to welfare, you'll keep receiving the UBI payments. At the very least, the data does not support the claim that UBI will lead to lower employment. Take Alaska, for example. The Alaska Permanent Fund has provided each Alaska resident an annual check simply for existing. This money comes from revenue derived from the oil industry, and is usually around $1 to $2,000. Economists determined that these payments have had no effect on employment, but have effectively reduced extreme poverty. A recently concluded study in Finland reported similar results. Recipients were no more or less likely to seek work, but reported improved happiness and reduced levels of stress. One of the largest UBI programs currently running, and the only one implemented at a national scale, is in Iran. Back in 2011, Iran rolled out a new program that distributed fairly large monthly payments to families in order to replace the phased-out subsidies for electricity, fuel, heating, water, and bread. These payments originally averaged roughly 29% of each family's income, a significant amount, and have been scaled back in recent years. But again, economists found that the monthly payments did not affect employment numbers. We've seen similar results around the world, from Kenya to India to Namibia. And in each location, the UBI payments did not affect employment, but did increase mental and physical well-being, reduce poverty-related crime, and increase school attendance. The other main argument against universal basic income is that it would be too expensive and difficult to implement. This is a serious concern. Estimates for establishing UBI in the United States vary, but they're generally in the trillions of dollars. That's a lot of money. Some opponents of UBI will say that money is wasted, or it's simply not feasible. Others, including many of my fellow socialists, will say that UBI won't fix the inherent problems of the capitalist system, and that it would sap resources from other pressing needs, like implementing universal healthcare. Whereas the concern that UBI would disincentivize work can be pretty well dismissed at this point, the cost and efficacy concerns deserve some real attention. There are ways we could reduce the complexity of implementing UBI, like skipping the means testing entirely and just giving every single adult a flat payment, then taxing the very wealthy at a higher rate to recoup that money. But we can't ignore the giant multi-trillion dollar price tag. Really, it comes down to evaluating our priorities. Are robots suddenly going to take all the jobs? No. It will be a gradual process, and really, it's not even a sure thing. We have other, more pressing concerns, like mitigating climate fallout and implementing a humane healthcare system that covers everyone and doesn't bankrupt you for using it. And this is where everything falls apart. There are so many things we need to spend money to fix, and no one will ever agree completely on the right order in which to fix them. UBI is one of the more fascinating proposals simply because it's so polarizing and there's not a clear ideological divide. Maybe that's a good sign, maybe not. Whatever the future holds for UBI, I think it's an ideal we can all aspire to. A society where human value is not derived from selling hours of your life for a wage, where people can pursue their passions and produce beautiful things to share with the world, where everyone can afford the necessities of life and poverty has become a thing of the past. We'll debate the means of achieving this goal for years to come, but at least it's a goal we can all share. If you've seen my last few videos, you'll have noticed that YouTube has been demonetizing a lot of them. That's why some of my creator friends and I teamed up to build Nebula, a streaming platform built by and for YouTubers like me, so we don't have to worry about demonetization. Since Nebula is all about creating thoughtful content, we've partnered with CuriosityStream, an established streaming platform with a solid track record of caring about great educational content and the financial security of those who produce it. 
Curiosity Stream is an online streaming service with thousands of nonfiction titles from some of the best filmmakers in the game. You can find tons of great episodes like their Dream the Future series, which offers hours of content you'll love if you enjoyed this week's video. As educational creators ourselves, we love Curiosity Stream. So, we've worked out a deal where if you sign up for Curiosity Stream at the link below, you'll also get access to Nebula, 100% free. For a limited time, Curiosity Stream is offering 26% off their annual plan. That's less than 15 bucks a year for both Curiosity Stream and Nebula which, in my humble opinion, is a pretty great deal. Since we're all stuck inside anyway, why not spend some time watching fascinating documentaries on CuriosityStream? Or check out Nebula's original content, like Real Engineering's Logistics of World War II series. You can also watch all my videos as they were intended, ad-free. There really is something for everyone, and by signing up at the link below, you're helping us produce more content without the fear of demonetization. Give CuriosityStream a shot, and get free access to Nebula when you sign up using the link below. It really does help support my channel and educational creators all across YouTube. If you enjoyed this video and you'd like to see more like it, consider subscribing to stay up to date with my latest episodes. If you hated it, go ahead and drop a thumbs down. You can check out my previous episodes by clicking the links on your screen. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next week.